Hey class, we are going to be talking about the last section of my paper. Um, something I forgot to tell you about, or just inform you of. This in this paper, I do a lot of foot or a lot of end notes. I'm citing tons of research being done. Right, um, most of those articles are really short. I think they're really manageable in terms of reading them, and you can find a ton of them online for free, full PDF files. Um, if you Google them, uh, the actual title or the author, a lot of times the author will have a, a web page, a home page, and then they'll just put a ton of their articles for free. You can download them on PDF and read them right there. Look, the, look at the actual research, right? Some of them are a ton of like scientific jargon, but you can get the gist of it if you read it. So if you're interested in exploring those things further or deeper, um, if something looks particularly interesting, you can usually find those things online for free. Uh, not always, but a lot of the time. So that's a side note. So today, connecting the pieces. I'm making an argument. A lot of our moral judgments and behavior stem from emotion, affect-laden intuition. They happen immediately, instantaneously. Reason comes along after, tries to justify, Sometimes it's a good justification, sometimes not, sometimes consistent, sometimes not. But those are for really thoughtful people. A lot of the world doesn't even take the time to care about being consistent with their moral judgments or behavior. If we're going to change, improve, making judgments and making decisions, I argue we're going to need to train our intuitions, train our emotions in certain ways, and that we ought to use virtue theory. The last section tries to give an example to say, and here's what this training would look like. Meditation. From my, if in my life, it's Christian prayer. But often that means sitting before God in silence, right? Really trying to say, Lord, I want to do your will. Speak to me. Let me hear you. Doing this consistently and repeatedly trains our brains, reshapes them, reshapes our intuitions, and in this case, there's evidence to suggest makes us more compassionate. It results in behavior. Okay, well then, if that's true, if this training reshapes my brain and my judgments and my behavior, maybe other kinds of disciplines, spiritual disciplines, might improve me in other ways. And so we start to focus on meditation, right? Again, I said we're using this because the Dalai Lama has brought the monks to the United States and said, have MRIs done, have it, have it done before they're meditating, during, after, compare them to non-experts um, and see what results, right? What sorts of, what difference does meditation make on the brain and, and on its function? So some of the things that next expert meditators show, sustained gamma band activity related to memory, attention, um, all sorts of things, right, related to like rational cognition, increased cortical thickness. Cortical thinning is often related to all kinds of things as we get older, um, Alzheimer's and whatnot. But they had increased cortical thickness. This is also often related to thought processes, attention, regulation, and memory and whatnot. Obviously, they're able to sustain and regulate attention. Crazy good. Increased immune function, very interesting that they have like more white blood cells, that their uh, immune system function at a higher level on average, right, more than non-expert meditators. Um, a higher degree of pain tolerance, lower rates of depression. These two have actually been used now for people who are not expert meditators, but people who are struggling with lower back pain. There's been a recent, some recent research done that participating in meditation can actually help so that they're not using as much medication, um, but also experiencing less pain. And people who are depressed, instead of giving them medication, it's lowering medication, participating in meditation instead of medication. And uh, those meditators, again, have seen some positive results with regard to depression. So all kinds of things seem to be happening here. I focus just on loving kindness meditation. It's the kind I'm most interested in. I think it's the kind most relevant for morality. There's all kinds. There's free association meditation and um, other kinds, but I'm just going to sort of deal with the research here. 
Loving kindness meditation is a meditative technique used to increase feelings of warmth and caring for self and others. Typically, it involves quiet contemplation in a seated position. Attention is then directed towards warm and tender feelings for a particular person, a loved one, a spouse, a child, a colleague, right, a parent. Slowly, these warm feelings, excuse me, slowly these warm emotions are expanded to include the person meditating, so yourself, the meditator's community, the church, humanity as a united whole, and eventually the world, just trying to emanate compassionate thoughts on creation, right, back to God and on, our, on ourselves and others. The goal of such meditation is to produce, produce a state in which an unconditional feeling of loving kindness and compassion pervades the whole mind as a way of being, with no other consideration or discursive thought. Accor excuse me, according to the loving kindness meditation tradition, such training helps feelings and actions that benefit others arise more naturally. Hear the virtue? The hard one second nature, right? Research on loving kindness meditation, right? I talk about Barbara Fredrickson. She goes into a workplace. These are not expert meditators, just in a workplace. Asks for volunteers to go through some experiments during lunch. She talks about, she says it's going to be stress relief. Half the group, they go through meditative training, compassion meditation, and they participate in it for several months at lunch. The other group does not. Each group is asked to keep a journal, a daily journal about how they're feeling. It's a list of the same questions about how they feel about themselves, others, satisfaction at work with relationships, physical health, all kinds of things. Sure enough, after this daily meditative practice, and they do it for several months, those doing the meditation showed higher levels of positive feelings for themselves and others, lower issues of health, so less days missed because of sickness, greater forms of satisfaction at work and self-acceptance, and yet those that didn't showed no change over those months to keeping it the same daily sort of questionnaire. That's powerful. You know, I want to be praying more. What was so powerful to me was to read that two weeks after the training and the meditation had stopped, so they hadn't been doing it for two weeks, the results still held for a lot of the participants, that it was longer lasting. It wasn't just a, an initial boost because I meditated that day, but even after the fact, because I had created a habit, it was longer lasting. Lutz and Davidson, they do a series of, Lutz and Davidson are like the gurus of this meditation research. They did a series of experiments. One of my favorites is that they took experts, um, the, these Tibetan monks, they took some amateurs who had been meditating for a little while and some novices who had not meditated at all, and they would have them go into meditative states. They had MRIs, right, sort of on their brains as they're meditating and whatnot. And then they would pump sounds in during their meditating, like as a disruptive thing, right? So they had these headphones on in the MRI machine. Some of the sounds were of a child crying. Some were a door opening or closing. Some a dog yelping. So some had emotional valence and some didn't. What was interesting is that those monks that were experts in meditation had a higher emotional reaction to the baby crying. Um, what was also interesting is that when they, they would also go through a 10 minute period where they were just sort of in the MRI machine, like having a downtime or rest time in between sessions, they would also put, produce these sounds during the rest period when they weren't meditating. And the monks that were experts in meditation still had a higher emotional reaction, we can see the brain waves in the MRI machine, to the baby crying and the dog yelping than the non-expert and the novice. So it's not just when they're meditating that they have a higher emotional reaction. They've trained themselves through compassion meditation to react more compassionately, naturally, just from a sound that comes in while you're meditating. Your brain activity is different because you've meditated longer. You're training yourself to be empathetic. There was no real difference when they would have neutral sounds like door opening or closing. Although, the expert meditators were able to hold their concentration better during those interruptions, which is interesting. So again, we see some pretty strong evidence. 
Uh, Susan uh, Lieberg, this is brand new, this is like 2011, um, the Zurich Pro Social Game. And here she devised the computer game where you've got a maze that you're trying to solve, and you do this for money. Um, so the faster you can get through the maze, the more money you get. As you go through the maze, certain blocks, certain gates appear that block your path, and the gates have a color, red gate, green gate, blue gate. You find keys along your path, with a certain color, and the green key will open the green gate, the blue key will open the blue gate, etc. So you collect keys, you use them to open gates, you get to the end, and you get money. In the bottom right hand portion of the screen, you see another maze with another person trying to navigate it. And you're told, the experimenters are told, participants, that that's someone in a different area. That's someone online doing it in a different town. Right? You get no benefit financially from helping them. But over time you play the game, you realize you can share keys. You can give them your blue key to open their blue gate, but then you lose the key. So if you run into a blue gate, you're not going to have the key. It's going to take you longer to get through your maze. And you're going to make, make less money. So she wanted to see how much will people share? How pro-social will people be? How will they help one another? Right? And so they do a bunch of trials, seeing how helpful people are, or how not helpful. And then they take groups, and they put some through loving kindness meditation for uh, two weeks, four weeks, something like that, but for you know every day for an extended period of time. The other group, they don't get the same training. Then they have them play the game. Those that went through loving kindness meditation, we're more pro-social. We're more likely to share their keys. We're more likely to be compassionate, right? Seeing the person struggle and help them. Those that didn't go through the meditation training had no, no increase. Again, the, what, what was surprising to me was to say, even when they did this, weeks later, those that went through the compassion meditation still were more likely to be pro-social. Fascinating stuff. It seems that we can train our brains through spiritual practices, so that compassion is more natural to us, even below the level of consciousness, that our intuitions have actually been reshaped. Powerful, right? And this is sort of the conclusion, right? It seems that the discipline, the spiritual discipline of meditation, reshaped the brain, training moral intuitions to be more compassionate. This is more of the cutting edge. More things are happening all the time. Every month, new stuff's being published about um, gratitude, compassion, pro-social behavior and whatnot in the brain. And so I just think we're in a really fun time to be going to college and to be educated, to be, to be learning and to be thinking about spiritual disciplines and spiritual formation. I hope you feel the same. Again, I've been having a great time, great class. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll see you online.